outside of WHO who tested positive for COVID-19. So I'm joining from home today, doing my part and quarantining for 14 days following the WHO guidance. As usual on Wednesday, um, we have Dr. Mike Ryan and Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove answering your questions about COVID-19. So please, if you're watching us on Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube, leave your questions via comment section. If you're watching us on Twitter, please use hashtag AskWHO. Uh, good afternoon, Mike, Maria. It's good to see you uh, in this new year, and I hope you managed to have a little of a break and time with your, with your families um, in previous weeks. Hey, Alex. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um, before we ended 2020, um, we had some positive news about COVID-19 vaccines uh, that brought us hope, uh, especially entering a new year. But on the the development with new virus variants uh, that caused some concerns uh, among general public. Um, so can you please give us an update? What's the epidemiological situation now uh, in comparison to a few weeks ago when we last spoke? So hi, Alex. First of all, I just want to commend you for playing your part and staying in quarantine and being in quarantine, identifying yourself as a contact and doing that. It, I can't tell you how much it matters uh, for everybody to do what they can to break these chains of transmission. And so thank you for, for doing that. And thank you for sharing that with the audience watching today. So well done on you and to everyone who's out there who is in quarantine, um, you know, keep yourself uh sane and safe and happy and healthy and um thank you thank you very much um so the epi situation um i mean it, it's a mixed global situation as as we we've been saying over over many weeks now um you know globally we you know we're hitting over 85 million cases that are reported which of course is likely to be underestimated of the true number of infections but the transmission is very different across the world sorry just there the transmission is very different across the world. Um, and, and it's really concentrated, the intense emphasis is concentrated in the central right now. Um, we still see a number of countries um, across Asia and the Pacific Islands and, and across the Pacific into the Mekong Delta region, some countries in Africa that have done a tremendous job of bringing transmission under control. They're keeping case counts low. Um, you know, they're opening up their societies and, and they're working very hard to make sure that they can rapidly detect any cases and clusters and really, you know, stop any clusters from becoming community transmission again. And we do have a, a handful of countries that are really see, seeing incredibly intense transmission. Um, many countries across Europe, where we are right now, across North America, where we are, uh, where I'm from, um, you know, are really seeing some really... Um, scary numbers in terms of cases, in terms of hospitalizations, in terms of uh, admissions to ICU. And in some cities, we're seeing um, situations where hospital beds are full. Um, and we have examples of um, ambulances that are, are, are waiting outside of hospitals because they can't offload their patients. So those are situations that are, are um, especially serious. Um, over the Christmas and New Year holiday period, the December holidays that, that many people have celebrated across the world, um, we have seen some inks and mixing of, of people and families. Uh, and what I mean by that is typically if you think about, you know, and Mike, I'm sure you'll, you'll want to comment about this. Like if you think about how many people do you come in contact with every day, um, those are your contacts, the average number of people you come in contact with every day. Over the holiday periods, if you're visiting family, if you're visiting friends, if you're traveling, that number of contacts will increase. And for a number of people um, who uh, have visited family and friends, those contacts have increased and that will have an impact on transmission. Um, we're starting to see it now. Uh, we will see it in the coming weeks. And so in many countries, uh, we will see the situation gets worse before it gets better. Um, having said that, um, you've pointed out and you've heard us point out um, over time that uh, vaccines, uh, many vaccines um, are receiving, you know, results of the phase three trials they are becoming approved and they're now starting to be administered in a, in a number of countries. And that's an incredible uh, scientific achievement. It's an incredible logistic achievement. Um, but everyone is working really hard to make sure that production capacity is increased and that we get these vaccines, these safe and effective vaccines um, to all countries all over the world. 
and we focus on vaccinating those who are most vulnerable and most at risk. Um, while we wait for that to happen, there's still so much that we can do. So we have to maintain um, the momentum um, on all of our indi individual level actions. So the distance, the physical distancing, and, and this is incredibly important. So as I mentioned this, you know, the, the number of contacts that we, we have, we have to keep ourselves physically distant from people while remaining socially connected. Um, you know, we have to make sure that we're in rooms that have good ventilation. And Mike and I are in a room right now that has very good ventilation. We have windows, we have spacing, um, we're avoiding crowds. Um, and when we can't, we make sure we open the windows, we make sure we improve the airflow and the fresh air that can come in from the outside. Uh, we make sure we wear a mask, we have our hand hygiene, we don't go anywhere without our, without our hand hygiene. We practice respiratory etiquette, um, you know, and all of that matters um, into 2021. So we just need to really kind of keep focused and keep that energy up um, to make sure we do everything that we can um, because it's not over. Uh, we're not out of the woods, but um, these vaccines are a beacon of, of, of hope in addition to the tools we already have. Thank you, Maria. Mike, what is your reflection? No, I, it, it is tough and, you know, it, it, it just has to be, it has to be said, uh, you know, it, for many uh, people in the world, some are going into their third or fourth big lockdown. Uh, schools are staying closed across uh, many, many countries, which is something we all wanted to avoid. Um, so there's lots and lots of things that are, you know, uh, quite tough right now. We were, And there was that wave of expectation around the vaccines, and that's understandable. And the vaccines are still a huge and great hope, and they are going to roll out, and it will speed up, uh, and vaccines will move more, fa more quickly, and people will get them, and we'll gradually get that number up. But uh, in the meantime, uh, we're still in the fight here with this virus. And uh, you were saying before, we're to be at the fight of our lives, and, and, and we are. Uh, and and what we do know, and regardless of what we've learned about the new variants, and remember there have been variants of this virus around since the very beginning, right back in February and March, we were seeing variants. We've seen different viruses, uh, uh, different uh, variations. That's what a, var a variant actually means, where the virus has a small variation in its genetic code. It doesn't necessarily mean that the virus behaves any differently. Um, uh, you see that amongst humans all the time. We have slightly different uh, genetic codes. That's why we sometimes we look different and we we act different. Uh, it, it's exactly the same. It doesn't mean we are fundamentally different. These viruses, uh, these variants, are not fundamentally different to the previously circulating strains. They have differences, and those differences. Uh, may affect the way in which the virus binds to human cells, or it may affect the way in which the virus can reproduce itself successfully in, in the human body. Uh, what it hasn't changed is the way in which the virus transmits. So therefore, all of the measures we already have in place, like hand hygiene and physical distance, and reducing the number of people you're in contact with, and reducing proximity to people, reducing the time you spend with people, wearing masks, ensuring you're in a properly ventilated space, these are the things that will still work. Uh, they may not work 100% as the, uh, in, in the same way. It may take, you may mean that you need to, to be even more careful, but those same measures will work. So from that perspective, we have to double down on that. Now that is tough. That's not easy right now because everyone's just, uh, you know, this is a, we're, we're all a year into this. It's a really, really long battle to have with, 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 with any situation. Um, but you know, previous generations have been through uh, worse. They've been through wars and other things that have lasted uh, uh, many, many years. Uh, and I'm sure those older and wiser amongst us will be able to counsel us to how to be able to pick up and fight again this year. What we do have this year, which we didn't have at the beginning of last year, is not the hope of vaccines. We actually have them. Uh, and that's the difference right now. So we've got another three or six months of a hard, hard road ahead of us, uh, but we can do it. Um, and we will do everything in our power working with COVID, the COVAX uh, initiative to ensure that we, working with the member states, working with governments all over the world, that we maximize the production and distribution of those vaccines so that everyone that needs a vaccine 
can actually get one. That is the hope. And we want to be able to do that on the most equitable basis possible. We want to protect those who are most at risk, those who are most vulnerable, those who are most likely to die if they get this infection. And we're really, really focused on that. And we're recommitting ourselves this year to doing that and sustaining the effort in surveillance and in response and in clinical management uh, and improving diagnostics and improving therapeutics and doing further research on, on the vaccines as well. So I enter the year with a sense of um, hope and determination, but also realism that everyone's been through a lot. Uh, and I know how hard it is for everyone out there to sustain the kinds of behaviors that are going to continue to break the chains of transmission here. It's not easy. It's easy for me here to sit here and tell people what to do. It's much more difficult in your daily life a year into this to continue doing that. But quite frankly, it works and it stops this virus. And we're just going to have to get with the program and continue to do that because we have no options right now we have no other option and what we have is the cavalry is coming the vaccines are coming but they're not here yet for most people in the world and we have got to stay the course with the other measures thank you so much mike question i'm sorry to Sir, I didn't actually answer your question. You you mentioned specifically on the variants. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have information on some um, variants, as, and as Mike has explained, these are just these are viruses that have changed. Um, and as you've heard us say before, viruses change all the time. Um, these are natural mutations. We tend to like to use the word change instead of mutation because mutation sounds like an incredibly scary word. Um, but these are changes in the virus. Um, there are two um, virus variants um, that have been detected. They're separate uh, viruses, one in the United Kingdom and the second one in South Africa. Um, they're different viruses. Um, one in the UK is called Variants of Concern 2020-1201. I don't expect you to remember that, but I say that because that's the name of the, the variants of concern. And the other one is called the 501YV2. In, from South Africa. Um, we are working very closely with scientists and, and professionals in both South Africa and the United Kingdom, as well as our partners across the international lab network um, to study these viruses. Um, in the UK, uh, the variant of concern um, was detected um, through the surveillance activities of Public Health England and partners. Um, and they noticed that there was an increase in transmission um, among people living in Southeast England and London uh, in late November and early December, despite the fact that they were in these tier two, tier three uh, lockdown measures. And so they went back and, and said, what is happening here? Um, and through discussions through our virus evolution working group, um, we had some partners from South Africa who were saying, well, we were noticing something different and we identified a virus variant that has this one mutation. Maybe perhaps you should have a look. Um, our colleagues in the UK did that, and they identified this variant of concern. What we understand from this virus is that um, the, the people who have are infected with this variant compared to other SARS-CoV-2 viruses, they have the same disease presentation, the same level of severity as measured by the amount of people needing hospitalization and those who are dying um, from infection. So there's no change in disease severity, so that's important. But there is an increase, there appears to be an increase in transmissibility with this virus variant compared to the other wild type viruses. Um, and the increase um, is uh, an increase of how many people one individual can infect. Um, and it's an increase, normally you think of, I can if I am infected, I might infect one person. If I infect more than one person, then, a, then an outbreak can take off. Um, and we call that the reproduction number. And there's an increase in the reproduction number with this variant from 1.1 to about 1.5, 1.7. And so that's not good um, in that sense, but um, it's not catastrophic in the sense that we, it means that it's out of control and, and there's nothing that we can do. We still can use the measures, as Mike has said, as you've heard me say, we can still use the measures um, of physical distancing and hand hygiene, staying home if you're unwell, isolate if you're a case, quarantine if you're a contact. Um, these break chains of transmission, and this will work with this variant. Um, but the scientists are still studying all these viruses. They're looking at the antibody response. They're looking at potential impact of diagnostics and therapeutics. We have no indication um, that there's an impact on the vaccines that are, are being rolled out. That's very good news. 
Um, that's the information we have so far. Studies are ongoing. Our colleagues in the UK are, are providing results to us almost in real time. Um, and in fact, we needed to cut down the, the number of phone calls we had with them because we need to give them the time to do the studies themselves. The same types of studies are happening in South Africa with the variant that was identified in South Africa. This is this 501YV2. So we're grateful for the scientists and the collaborations that are happening in South Africa as well. But it is important for the viewer to understand that you know these, these mutations do happen. Um, there is a process that's in place among scientists and professionals to, to, to determine which ones are important and why, um, and what does this mean? So there's a lot of study that's underway, but the good news is that, that neither of these variants appear to, to um, cause more severe disease. Um, there may be an increased transmissibility, but we're, it, it doesn't mean that the measures at hand don't work they do work. Um, and so it complicates matters, but I'm hopeful that this type of event, if I'm a silver lining kind of person, will spur us for even more stronger action, more collective action to get through this. Um, as Mike has said, and as EG said in his speech yesterday, we are in the, you know, the race of our lives. And this race is a type of a sprint marathon. It's not a slow jog. It's a, it's a marathon that we've been in at a sprinting pace for a year now. And it, it's, a, it's a race to prevent as many infections as we can. It's a, it's a race to prevent cases to develop severe disease. It's a race to save as many lives as we can. It's a race to roll out the vaccines, the safe and effective vaccines that are approved. It's a race to save our livelihoods and our economies that we live in. Um, and it's a it's a race to save our mental health and our and our love for our, our families. So we're in this together, um, and uh, and we will definitely stay determined to get through it together. Thank you so much, Maria. I'll I'll use the chance to summarize a few of the follow up questions that viewers are already sending about the new variants. Um, what, and it's more around the tools that we have in place. Are the same tasks being used to identify do these these changes? Uh, can we? Can we be confident in that? Also, do we expect that the vaccine will work against uh, these new variants of the virus? Um, and also, one one uh, viewer is asking, what are the differences between those uh, variants that are that have been identified in the UK, South Africa, um, and other places? Yeah. So the the I'll start with the second part. The the variants are different because. Um, the variant that was identified in the UK has a set of mutations, a certain number of mutations, um, and they're different than the set of mutations that were identified in South Africa. They share one common mutation at the at a location on the spike protein of the virus called the 501Y loca location, 501Y. Um, but they're different, and so they have a different uh, different set of mutations. But we're studying each of them separately. In terms of the tests. So this was a big question in the beginning. You know, we always need to make sure that any change in the virus can still be detected with our available tools that we have. Um, the good news is, is that these variants can still be detected with our PCR tests that we have, because most of the PCR tests that are used worldwide um, look at different parts of the genome of the virus itself. And they focus on three sites within the genome. And so that means we can still detect it. There's one test by that, but most tests worldwide have multiple gene targets. So that's good. The um, antigen-based tests also work as well, um, and so that's really good because the antigen-based tests are these rapid tests. They're super easy to use. You, they're much cheaper than PCR, and you get a result back within 15 minutes. Um, and those will still detect this variant. But one of the ways that the world identifies mutations is through full genome sequencing. Um, and this is something that's done in, in specialized labs all over the world, um, which look at the code of the virus itself. And these sequences are um, shared on public databases like this thing, for example, and there's others. But to date, more than 300,000 samples, sequences have been shared. And maybe some of you online have seen these really beautiful displays that they almost look like trees. And they basically use these sequences to show how the virus is changing, how the virus uh, moves between people. Um, and we have specialists 
who look at those sequences, they look at the epi data and the clinical data and help us kind of disentangle how this virus is moving around the world. That's called phylogenetics. Um, and so we are incredibly grateful for people working on sequencing and we're working very hard with our partners and, and countries all over the world to increase sequencing capacity. But it doesn't mean every virus, every case has to be sequenced. It just means that we need to make sure that we're looking amongst cases to see uh, who, uh, if there's any mutations that are happening. We've recently put out some advice um, to our member states on increasing testing capacity as well as sequencing capacity and focusing on a subset of the cases that are in your country, but also making sure you sequence any clusters that may be different. You know, if you notice that there's a change in transmission in terms of there's more transmission than you would expect, we would ask to sequence some people in those clusters. Or if you see some differences in disease presentation or severity, sequence those individuals. And so we can be strategic with our use of sequencing. And that's an additional tool that we have to help us understand where the virus is and how it's moving. And just on the issue of vaccines. Vaccines, yep. Yeah. The, um, the, the, there's absolutely no indication as yet that the the the, cur the vaccines as currently developed would not work in the case of, of this variant. Certainly, the data from the laboratory assays that that have been developed for the for this the, the, they still work in the case of, of for both. Um, and there is work going on in labs now looking at animal models, and we'll also be looking at other very specifically designed studies to track this over time. But right now, everyone should be assured, right now, as far as we can see, uh, the data is pointing to those, these vaccines still being effective. And we're not overly concerned that that is going to change. Uh, uh, but at the same time, we're driven by the data, we're driven by the science, and we're doing the studies that are needed to ensure these vaccines continue to work. Even if there was a change in that, it is actually relatively straightforward to tweak the vaccines. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's even if that were the case, there's still much we can do uh, to tweak that. And that is a great testament to, to modern science and the way we, we have much more control over what we can do with, with vaccines, uh, with vaccines uh, now. Uh, just going back to the, the, the concept of virus evolution, this virus has only probably been in human beings for just over a year. Uh, it evolved and emerged and, and, and jumped into human populations. What very often happens when a virus uh, jumps into uh, a human system, and we've seen this with Ebola and, and other diseases, they can tend to be very severe because they, 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 they don't choose, they don't develop, uh, over time viruses develop, um, um, it's not in their interest to kill their host. It is in their interest to be very infectious, uh, not kill the host. And they very often end up choosing a target organ you know, something with hepatitis viruses, they attack the liver and there are different viruses that attack different parts. They develop a kind of a, an organ that they 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 focus on uh, and that when a new virus emerges, it tends to affect many organs. Uh, it's a bit of a, uh, 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 in that sense, out of control. And uh, it takes time for the virus to gain what's called fitness or to become fit, to develop and adapt to the human system. So in this case, fit is not what many of you think. It doesn't mean attractive or sexy. It means they are muscular or whatever the, the, the word is used for nowadays. Uh, I, 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 it means that the virus adapts to the human system, not in a way to kill more people, but in a way to adapt to living in the human system. So what tends to happen is the viruses can become more infectious, but they rarely become more severe because it's not in their interest. It's not in their evolutionary interest. So I don't think we should be too concerned about the severity issue. We should be concerned in that sense about infectiousness. And what happens in a sense with this uh, change in the spike protein is it may allow the virus to uh, to be more efficient uh, at entering cells and producing copies of itself and actually may increase the viral load. In other words, the amount of virus that's in your respiratory tract. And if you just imagine this empirically, if there's more virus up your nose or in your in your in your lungs and you're coughing or breathing or singing, you can actually project more of that virus, uh, and therefore there's more of a chance that you may infect someone else. Your infectiousness increases. It doesn't change the way you infect another person. It just changes the amount of virus that you may have in your system, and therefore more people have a higher viral load. So in that sense, it's important that even if it is increasing viral load even if it is increasing uh, infectiousness, it's only increasing infectiousness 
if we don't do the things we need to do uh, in terms of physical distance, if we allow it to in, in that sense. So again, we need to come back to the idea that uh, the things we do to protect ourselves and protect others still work. We just need to be ever more vigilant in doing them and, and even more precise in, in how we you know, execute our behaviors. Think of yourself in the mindset of a virus, like the whole, the whole objective of a virus is to reproduce, is to replicate. So if it enters a host and it kills you too quickly, then you don't have an opportunity to pass someone else. It's really, I mean, it's, uh, that's its goal. And so it, it's in its, its fitness to mm -hmm. be able to infect more people, but not kill more people. So we are smarter than the virus. I know mm -hmm. viruses aren't alive, they have no smartness, you know, but we can outsmart, we are smarter, we have the tools that can prevent that from happening. And so we need to think about that. You know, this is kind of our be your own superhero thing. You know, you're smarter. You can think of it, if you're younger, think of it as a video game, you know, and this is life or death thing. So I'm not trying to make light of it, but we can outmaneuver this virus, the variant too. Let's outmaneuver it. Let's not give it an opportunity to in infect others. Yeah, I, I like the, oh, the, UK, the UK have a very uh, good uh, slogan. I think they call it hands, hands, uh, face. space and face. Yes. You know, just think about, you know, just think about the people, the number of people you're in contact with, proximity and time. Yeah. So people, proximity and time. How many people have I, been, have, been, have I been in contact with today? How close have I been to those individuals? And how much time have I spent with them? And we can all do that. You can calculate it yourself. Yeah. I've been in contact with 15 people today, but I've been more than a meter, more than two meters, more than three meters away from them. I've worn a mask. Uh, I've been in a room in which the, there's been good ventilation or the windows have been open, and I've spent 15 minutes or less. You're in a low risk category. Uh, if you've just gone to a, a party with uh, 60 people in, in a small room with no ventilation, where everyone, nobody is wearing a mask and you spend three hours there, you're in a risky environment. So you need to be able to look at a day's activity or a week's activity and say, how much risk have I been exposed to in this last hour, day or week? And you need to keep that risk level as low as you possibly can for yourself and for others. And I know we just go on and on and on about this, but there's, it, there's just no other way to, to put it. Matter. Our actions count, our actions matter. Mm -hmm. uh, they make a difference. So uh, even if we are uh, dealing with new variants and dealing with all of this uncertainty around vaccines and you know, the, this is not the things we want to be dealing with right now, uh, we still have to focus on those activities. Thank you so much both. Uh, here's a very good follow-up question um, regarding maintaining um, all precautionary measures for a long period of time. So uh, Spiros Armpis watching us from Facebook is asking, what do you think is the best way to address in sub-country community level the precaution measures so as all the people in the community in rural areas believe and follow the guidance for the benefits of their health and global health also? You, I think if I understand your question is at the community level, like what can people do at a community level? Is that right? Uh, what's the best way to ensure that people are maintaining precautionary measures in the long term? You know, a long one period of, the, of time. Yeah, that's a that's a really fantastic question. I mean, one of the things we're we're looking at and we will be spending more time trying to better understand is the motivation, the compliance, the adherence to measures that are in place. And one of the mm -hmm. things that we know um, that really helps is this collective um, attitude towards the approach. Um, you know, if, if I'm doing it, if you're doing it, we're doing this together. Um, you know, there's a lot of good examples. Um, Mike has brought up in the past, you know, drunk driving and, you know, there's a social norm around that, that, that is just not acceptable anymore you know, the wearing, and it, and it becomes a lot of the things that we're doing. And I notice this myself when I see people, my son will notice when we go, and we haven't been to a grocery store in a really long time, but when we were in a grocery store many months ago, he would say, you know, they're not in their masks. You know, I can see that. And you can see that people are looking to each other to see who is following the rules, so to speak. And you can see people who are taking a step back and making sure that I not only have my mask on, but I'm still doing my physical distancing. 
Um, and you can see that people are like learning from each other and, and seeing that like we can do this together and we're in this together and we should do the same things. We're learning from each other, we're finding ways. Um, I've seen this with other examples where you know you can't have that family gathering or you you miss that milestone birthday of someone and instead of saying well you know it doesn't i don't i don't care i'm still going to have that birthday party they'll do a drive by of somebody's house and they keep it and that that was a that was something that uh, caught on in some countries and so people were emulating each other's actions of saying like okay you know this isn't ideally what i would like to do well we can do this but i think at a community level whether it's a community in a village or if it's a religious community or if it's a youth community, that collective action together of we will do this, we all of us will do this together because this is going to keep us safe um, and this is for the time being. Um, I think that really helps because mentally we know that this is something that we're going to get through and we, and we, can, we can manage. Yeah. And it, 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 it does come back like you've done Alex, to, 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 to personal responsibility. There's one way in terms of reducing your risk of being exposed, but then when you have a potential exposure, what do you do next? What's the next part? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what you've done on my, uh, I have a, a niece in, in, in the USA, Megan. Hi, Megan, if you're watching. <laughs> uh, Megan is a little hero of mine because uh, she was, uh, she was uh, uh, at home and, and she became, uh, and thought she might have been in contact with someone, but she immediately self isolated and kept it alone and wouldn't let her father or mother or anyone come near her, comfort her, said, No, I think I could be sick. I think I could. And everyone thought, Oh, there's probably no reason for you to be sick. She was positive, but nobody else in her household got her sister didn't get sick, her mom didn't get sick, her grandmother, mm. who's got underlying conditions, didn't get sick, her dad didn't get sick because she took her own action. Uh, and she's my hero, not the epis, not the epidemiologists. She's my hero because she took action uh, like you've yeah. taken. And if every person takes that, that action at the moment where you feel something is wrong, take action. If you feel at risk in a situation, get out of that situation. If you think you're coming down with a fever, isolate yourself until you're tested. Uh, if you're a contact like you are, Alex, quarantine yourself. So that if you do then become sick, you haven't exposed anybody else. Because that's the, it's not in you quarantining yourself. What you're doing is ensuring that if you get sick, you haven't any contacts. Your number of contacts will be zero. That's the principle mm -hmm. of you going into quarantine. That if you get sick, God forbid, you will. Uh, and, and, yeah. But the fact is that what you're actually saying is, and this is the reality, you're going into quarantine. The virus may or may not be reproducing right now. In, in you, and you may or may not get uh, infected, but what you're absolutely ensuring by self-quarantine is that nobody else, you've broken the chain. Even if you get sick, you've broken the chain. Because you're not going to allow anyone else to get infected. That is the principle of quarantining when you're in contact. It is a gift to the world. It is a gift to your community. It is a gift to your family. And it's a responsibility. Uh, and if we could see more people taking that positive action to protect others, uh, so it's not just about avoiding the crowded spaces. And I think a lot of transmission has occurred because people have been unsure. Well, I'm, I'm not feeling very well today. I have a headache and I feel a bit clammy, but I go to work and see how I feel, all right? I've seen this, and then person goes to work, and two days later or a day later, they're confirmed, and then all of their contacts are in quarantine, and some of those people get sick. If you're in doubt, if you need to, and this is one of the failures, I think, in this response, is that we have not been able to get enough people who are feeling sick to go into isolation or support them in that, or people to go into quarantine or support them in that quarantine. I think it's been a fundamental shortcoming in this response all across the world. And in countries that have done this and supported people and communities in quarantine and in isolation of sick individuals have done much better. It's not just about having all this physical distancing. It's, it's the public health measures, the social measures, it's the quarantine measures, it's the isolation measures. It's all of that put together that gives you control on this virus. The problem is if you miss out on any one of those elements, you struggle. You have to bring all of those elements into play. Uh, and that's been the struggle in this uh, whole pandemic is 
is maintaining. It's like juggling for a very long time. Anyone can juggle three balls for a minute, but if you have to sit there and you've got to juggle uh, those balls and you've got to do it for hours, you lose concentration. You, it's very hard. Even a simple thing is very hard to do for a very long time. Uh, uh, fatigue and exhaustion and disinterest, it happens. So I, it's just... Uh, amazing to see individuals like you Alex individuals like my 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 niece Megan take the kind of action that actually saves the lives uh, and that is saving lives Alex you are I mean what you and what people are doing when they can isolate in cases that are in isolation you know the virus stops with them you know that is a that is like uh, and and we still see that the majority of people who are infected with this virus do have a mild form of the disease and that is fortunate we are there are complications there are people that develop severe disease but for most people the virus stops with them because they don't have an opportunity because they're in isolation the virus has nowhere to go and so it stops with them and with you it's the same thing you might not be infected and i hope that you are not but the virus has nowhere to go um and i think that you know what you're doing what people are doing all over the world to do that i mean is is an act of solidarity. It's an act of support in ending this pandemic. But as we've said, we have to make sure people are supported in that. It is very easy to say to stay home, but you know, yeah. if you're a single people, mom working for cash, mom, you know, and if, and if you work to to earn income to feed your family, and you and if you don't mm -hmm. work, you don't have that mm -hmm. money to feed your family. That is a, a legitimate, mm -hmm. real world issue. And that's why we need governments to support people in isolation. We need governments to support people in quarantine. Um, we need people, you know, who are in quarantine to reach out and say, I need some help with my, I need some help with my groceries. Can you leave something outside? Or if you're a neighbor, you check in on your neighbors. There's ways in which that we, we as individuals can support people in quarantine and in isolation, but we need that whole of society to help do that. Um, and we're seeing that happen. Um, we're seeing we're seeing that happen. That needs to be even stronger in 2021, because we cannot forget the fundamentals of how we prevent the virus from spreading, and that's that's really important. But you know, the virus stops with me. Um, you know, you what people are doing is you are saving a life, um, and and I think that um, that is heroic. You've heard you heard us say it is heroic, and we are not being overly dramatic. But everything that you do to not let it spread saves yourself and saves your loved ones. Thank you. Thank you both very much uh, personally and uh, for all the encouragement and uh, also for your leadership and the support we have uh, from Dr. Tedros, from our director of communications, who is my boss, and uh, Gabby, and all other colleagues who have been very supportive uh, through, through this time. and the, we had this opportunity uh, to stay in quarantine and stay at home when needed to to save to save others from from getting infected. Um, as as you just said, it's not the case for everyone around the world, unfortunately. Um, I would I would pass the next question to you from Robin Taylor, who is also watching us from Facebook. Um, he says that he had COVID. He's better now, but he's he's wondering for how long do I have immunity? Can I get it again? I'm at risk and 65. Um, I do all the protocol. I go nowhere. My brought my daughter brought it to me. So it's wonderful to hear that Robin has been. Thanks for watching, Robin, and it's great to hear that you've recovered. Um, so we are learning about the immune response in individuals, and you've heard me say that several times before. And a year in, we still don't have a complete picture. But what we understand is that people who have been infected with this virus develop an immune response. And we've seen that immune response being developed from people who've had mild disease, who've had severe disease, even people who've had asymptomatic infection uh, where they have no symptoms at all do develop an immune response. Um, and we're learning about how strong that is depending on the type of, how long the, how strong the immune response is depending on the type of severe disease that you had and for how long it lasts. Our current understanding based on all the scientific literature that is being published um, is that the immune response lasts for months. Um, and we have some studies that indicate that the immune response can last six months or longer. Um, and the reason I say six months or longer is because we need to, we haven't followed people up um, who've been a case 
for much longer than six, seven months, even though we're into it. We actually have to follow individuals who've been infected and test for antibodies over many, many months. And so the good news is that we do see an immune response for, for a robust immune response for, for many months. Um, but we're, we're not sure how long it will last. And our experience with other coronaviruses, so not SARS-CoV-2, but other coronaviruses, um, the common cold, um, there are four of them, and also MERS coronavirus, and then the first SARS coronavirus, um, tell us that the immune response won't last your entire lifetime. So what happens is over time, the antibodies that you develop that will protect you from getting infected again will decline over time. Um, and so it is important that you still adhere to the measures that are in place, you know, keeping yourself safe, keeping your distance, um, because we have examples of reinfection. Um, I say examples because they're not, it's, it seems to be um, that it's not as, it's not very common, um, but it can happen. And so when something tells us that it can happen, it means that you have to take precautions against that from happening. So that's why we recommend, you know, continuing to adhere to all the public measures um, that are in place. So, so keep it up. Thank you. Yeah. And Robin, you should uh, also consider getting vaccinated. I think yeah. it's been a few months since the uh, regular infection, and that would certainly give a boost to your immunity. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely advise that you consider. I think you're in the 65-year-old yeah. Bracket. I don't know what country you're in, but uh, you should be someone who would be in one of the first groups offered vaccination. So, and you should put yourself forward for that. And uh, congratulations on your recovery. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Here is another question from uh, Nerissa Brown. Can you give more realistic guidance to families on what to do if a some household situations complicate isolating a family member? Mm. I missed the part about the situation at home. You cut out, Alex. Uh, oh, I'm uh, sorry. Can you give more realistic guidance to families on what to do if a family member tests positive? Some household situations complicate isolating a family member. Absolutely. That is a it's a it's an excellent question and it's a very common one because most people live with others. You know, they live with their family members and in many parts of the world. Um, we have multi-generational homes, you know, people live with their children and their parents, um, and, and not everybody has many rooms within their homes. Um, so ideally, um, somebody who is infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, ideally, it would be good for them to isolate outside of their home in a medical facility. The reason I say ideally is because we know that that's not possible all over the world. But depending on someone's age, their underlying conditions, um, if someone is over 60 years old or has underlying conditions, they're more at risk for developing severe disease. So WHO recommends that they're isolated and cared for in a medical facility to, to make sure that they're monitored very closely in case they do develop severe disease or, or decline quickly. Um, for individuals who have mild disease um, in, or asymptomatic infection, um, in some countries, what they've done is they've set up these facilities, these community-based facilities where people can isolate outside of their home, um, like a fever clinic. You know, we've seen places across many countries that have built um, purposeful built uh, locations or repurposed buildings for people with mild disease and they're isolated outside of their home. Now, if you have to isolate at home, and many people are in this situation, um, ideally it would be good that you separate yourself into your own bedroom, ideally with your own bathroom, and you keep yourself separate from your other family members. Any interaction you have with a family member, and that should be limited to maybe one person who could provide food for you or care for you, you both should be wearing masks and you both should be wearing medical masks in this situation. Um, if you're in a situation where you can't isolate in a room, in your own bathroom, try to keep your distance from your family members as best you can. Um, make sure that in the household you're wearing masks. And in this case, wear medical masks. Um, if you have access to them, if not, wear fabric masks. Um, make sure that you perform your hand hygiene and you wash your hands regularly, that you disinfect surfaces, uh, you make sure that you um, you get plenty of food and plenty of rest and plenty of water and all that. Speak to your medical provider um, as often as you can to, to seek advice. I probably should have started with that recommendation first. Definitely speak to your medical provider to get the direct advice on your situation. 
for us, it's, it's difficult to give individual level advice because of your, you know, it depends on your age, it depends on your underlying conditions, if you have any, um, the nature in which you live and, and whatnot. Um, but as best you can, um, stay away from your family members and limit your interaction to maybe one person in, in the home who is of younger age, who doesn't have an underlying condition, who can care for you. Um, but do the best, do the best that you can um, in keeping distant from others, but do keep in touch with your medical provider. Thank you very much, Maria. I, I would ask an, an, another question from Hanesh Khalid. Um, do we have any standards or certifications on reusable masks related to COVID-19? So Maria, maybe we can remind our viewers on which type of masks are recommended by WHO to stay safe from this virus. Yes, so we uh, recommend the use of masks as part of a comprehensive package to reduce the spread of COVID-19. The reason I start with that because masks alone are not enough. Um, and we don't wanna see an over-reliance on only one measure. So it's really important that people that wear masks, whether it's a medical mask or a fabric mask, wear it appropriately, you start with clean hands, you put it on, uh, you cover your nose and your mouth, and then you clean your hands, you make sure that you adhere to all the other measures that are in place, you know, when you have that mask on. If you touch the outside of it, if you touch the outside of it, make sure that you wash your hands and then you wash your hands after you take it off. But wearing a mask doesn't mean that you don't physical distance. You still need to make sure you keep your distance from others. And I also say that because we've seen people wear masks and congregate and come really close together. And when you do that, if you do that with families, if you do that with friends, if you do that with drinks, mask starts to move down here, it starts to move under here, it starts to hang off your ear, and eventually it comes off. And so you have to make sure that you maintain all those other aspects of physical distancing, hand hygiene, mask wearing. Um, having said that, uh, we recommend medical masks for health workers um, who are caring for patients with COVID-19 or suspected to have uh, in, in, care, caring for cases with COVID-19, plus eye protection, plus gloves, plus gown. Um, if they're in facilities where there are certain medical procedures are done where the virus can be aerosolized, we recommend airborne precautions. And that's not a mask, that's a respirator. These are these N95 respirators plus additional measures. For the general public, if you're sick, um, if you're visibly sick, if you're noticeably sick, even a little bit sick, wear a medical mask. Anyone caring for you, wear a medical mask. Um, everyone else, for the general public, we recommend the use of a fabric mask. And these are, we recommend a three layer fabric mask. So the inner layer has a filtration system. We don't recommend the masks with the valves on the outside um, because that will allow air to go in and out and that will defeat the purpose of, of the mask. Um, but the fabric mask you wear um, when you cannot do physical distancing, um, when you're indoor or outdoor in areas where the virus is spreading. And we recommend that if you're in an indoor space and you don't know if there's good ventilation. If you're unsure, wear a mask, regardless of if you can keep your distance or not. And that's to make sure that um, you, you protect from source control if you're infected yourself uh, and you can prevent the spread. Um, and so there's a lot of different, it's a long answer because there's a lot of different circumstances in which someone can wear a mask or not. Um, but we also give these situations because in many parts of the world, they've controlled COVID-19. They've controlled transmission. Um, and they have lifted the mask mandates that they've, they've put out, the, the recommendations of wearing masks. If you're a farmer or someone working out in your field all by yourself, you know, you don't need to be wearing a mask. And so there's, there's certain situations where it's, 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 um, it's not needed. But I go back again, please, if you're wearing a mask, make sure you wear it safely, responsibly with good hand hygiene and still make sure that you maintain distance. Yeah, Thank you very much, Maria. Please Just go ahead, Mike. That. No, I, I think uh, that's a really, made a really important point uh, that wearing of masks gives, makes you less infectious to another if you're asymptomatic or even asymptomatic. And it gives you some level of protection from, from, from being exposed to others. Um, and uh, what it doesn't do, it, it, it completely defeats the purpose if you close the physical distance. Um, uh, and I've certainly had people who, uh, very recently, someone wearing a mask, I'm wearing a mask, the person came to give me a hug, and I said, no, I did the sort of hands back, and they said, but, but I'm wearing a mask. And I thought, 
Yes, but it still means we can't uh, we can't embrace much as all, more, much and all as I would have have loved to embrace. So the mask gives you that extra layer of protection, but it doesn't give you permission then to get rid of all the other issues. Hand washing and masks is exceptionally important because we're constantly, I mean, I'm sitting here right now without a mask. I, I don't know if I've touched my face, but I probably have not touched my face since we began. If I had a mask on here right now, I would be constantly moving it around. And I'm very conscious of the fact that when I'm wearing a mask, I'm always, I'm trying to stop myself adjusting it and touching it. If my hands are on the table and I'm touching this and on the phone and I'm doing that, and then I'm putting it back up and I'm adjusting my mask. So regular hand uh, disinfection while you're wearing a mask is, is very important as well. So I really hand hygiene and mask wearing go together, hand in hand. And when you're doing it, you must maintain the physical distance. You must be aware of issues like crowds, ventilation, and back to what I said before. Because it's putting all of those measures together that gives you the added benefit. Um, uh, the benefit of distance, the benefit of low density, the benefit of good ventilation, the benefit of the mask. You put them together, you're in a much safer place. You start to use one as an excuse not to do the other, you're actually putting yourself back in a dangerous place. Uh, so it's really important that we we remember that uh, uh, and uh, and use and they've become a fashion item for a lot of people. Masks have become very interesting and creative uh, use of masks. You know? <clears throat> yes, and it's really it's really been nice to see. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you very much, both. Here is the next question from uh, Liz Galsworthy: Should healthcare workers stay away from the general public when they are off shift? Well, that is a, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't separate health workers from others. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the recommendation is that people need to, to be physically distant from other people. I mean, arguably, um, it's the single most important thing people can do right now. Um, in addition to the other measures, these are critical with the masks, as you just heard us say, but the physical distancing is important. Um, everyone needs to consider what they do outside of their home, quite frankly, right now. And people need to understand that the decisions that they make when they leave their home um, either will put them at risk or at a higher risk, there's no zero risk right now, or, or not. Um, and what concerns me the most is that what I'm hearing from people is that they're they're almost justifying the actions that they're taking of saying, I did that, but but I also yeah, but I I um, you know I, I took that measure or I took this measure, and we have to realize that even if we go and do that, we're we're seeing a lot of people take trips that are not necessary, and I know that's a hard thing to say because I want to take trips too and I want to do things for recreation and 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 go on vacation too, but right now is not. Time. It is not the time. We are so close. You know, we have, we, we are seeing this finish line of this race that we are in. We have to stay the course. We have to remain determined and focused to get to that end. And everything that we do that prolongs the spread of this virus pushes us further and further away from that end point. And so the decisions we make about recreational trips, the decisions we make about going to that store when we don't need to go to that store, every single one of those trips matters. Where you live right now matters. So please, like, do the online shopping if you can. Support local businesses through online shopping if you can. Um, but stay home as much as you can, where you can. And I say this consciously knowing that in many areas where this virus is circulating at its most intense level, um, many our people are very fortunate um, and have internet and have delivery and have the ability to communicate with their loved ones and reach out to their loved ones anytime that they want. Um, by us making sacrifices and staying home right now, help those health workers who go out every single day and keep you and your loved ones safe, <clears throat> not only from COVID, but for cancer treatments, for HIV, for prenatal care, for delivering babies, for broken bones. We have to do what we can. Um, and it, I, please help us help yourselves 
end this and all of those decisions about things that we don't need to do right now, they really matter. Our actions have consequences, good or bad. Yeah, and just, um, it's very important we don't, uh, and it has happened, uh, stigmatize uh, health workers around this representing an extra risk. They're not an extra risk if we're maintaining physical distance, if we're maintaining hand hygiene, if we're not getting within the, uh, the minimum distance, we're maintaining our distance. If we apply those basic rules, then there is no problem. So it's really important we don't assign some level of risk or stigma specifically to health workers. Uh, they have suffered enough uh, in this pandemic without having that cast upon them. Uh, but everyone, including health workers, needs to be responsible. It's the same could be said for the, the other heroes in our society, uh, the bus drivers and the people who, who, who you know, who keep our essential services uh, working and those people working in the grocery stores who continue to serve us every day and give us our food. They're, 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 those people are, are keeping our societies moving. And it should be very, very important that we don't stigmatize them in some way as being an, another category of people that we have to avoid in some way. We have to avoid everyone in a way at the moment uh, and maintain physical distance. If we do it for everybody, then it doesn't matter who that individual is or isn't. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, thank you, Maria. And um, here's here's one question that's very interesting. And with this pandemic, we are also fighting an infodemic and uh, our team and other teams are, are working with different groups of partners to ensure people are having access to reliable information. So here's a question from Derek Jimenez. Why are so many people believing conspiracy theories and fake news instead of researching themselves and finding out the facts? Oh, that's a it's a good question, Alex maybe. or Derek. <laughs> Derek, that's a good question. Maybe, yeah, maybe maybe you should answer that question, Alex. Yeah, actually, I, why you know, don't you why question? don't you answer that question? <laughs> I am here just to pass the questions oh, <laughs> to, to the experts. You know, it's it's like with this infodemic that we have, with all of the information that is out there, um, our our brains, our bodies are not meant to absorb this much information all of the time. Um, some of the information out there is very good. It comes from reliable sources and it is it's evidence based, it's science based. There are a lot of conspiracy theories that are out there um, that are very compelling. You know, if you look at them, they're they're very compelling um, with the way that they are produced, you know, the imagery that's there. Um, and they're very dramatic in that sense, where if you look at some of the things that are out there and if you didn't know, you could very easily believe. Um, but I think what's important is where you get your information from. Um, and to try to limit the information that you take in, you know, know the source of where it's coming from, but sometimes it's good to shut it off. It's good to, to move away from the news. There's very good news out there. I'm not saying that all the news is bad, but to move away from the noise and, and move away from social media, and I know you're watching us on social media, um, but turn it off for a portion of your day, every day, so that you you create can create some space, you know. And and we had this a little bit over the holidays, you know. Um, we did have some 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 time away uh, from the office, which was which was good. I had some time with my kids. Um, we we're in our pajamas and playing with matchbox cars and trains on the floor, and there was no. I put my phone in the other room and there was no TV and there were no screens and there's just a little bit of space from that. Um, and it gives you a little bit of perspective, but know your source, you know, try to turn it off. Um, and if you have a question, you know, ask the questions from somebody who knows. Um, and there's a lot of ways in which you can, you can get some good information that's out there, but the conspiracy theories, there's plenty of them out there uh, that are pretty wild, I have to say. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, look, at the end of the day, we are social animals, you know. Before we had uh, social media, we had gossip and we had, uh, yeah. we had other things. You know, we, we are all attracted to stuff that's dramatic, that has a bit of intrigue. We, you know, why are so many films made about conspiracies? Why do they sell? Because we're attracted to that idea. Uh, it's, it's very attractive to us. So I'm not, it, it, that in itself is not bad. It's when that's manipulated uh, for the means uh, and the will of a few. That's when it's dangerous. When 
half of 1% or a tenth of 1% or a million of the population can control the thought of the mass. That is when it's dangerous. That is very, very dangerous. Uh, uh, and social media for me is great. It connects us, it allow, allows us to communicate. It is a wonderful tool for accountability. State systems, governments and others have become much more accountable because the community is on them now. Uh, and that accountability is immediate. It's uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable for us. You know, in the old days, the doctors and others stood on their pedestals and were, you know, adored or or not. But they were they 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 had that absolute power, that absolute right to control the lives of people, be it in the church, be it in the 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 judiciary, the police, and whatever. And people very often lived in very disempowered positions. Uh, social media is empowering. Uh, I've seen it. We've seen it with attacks on healthcare. We have been able to detect attacks on healthcare by people using social media to notify us of things happening, and we've been able to document then through investigation real attacks on healthcare systems in, in conflict-affected countries. It can be a very and is a positive uh, force in our society. But like any powerful force, it can be turned for good or it can be turned for bad. Uh, and it is our choice how we use this wonderful platform uh, of information uh, and sharing. Are we going to use it to create a more accountable, kinder, respectful world in which authorities are held to account for what they do in our service? I am held to account for what I say to you and what we do here as scientists at, at, at WHO. Uh, but we do that in a respectful way. Uh, we inquire through the use of social media. Uh, we ask, we demand sometimes. And we should, and we need to demand more of our leaders. We need to demand more of the people who, who in our society have had the chance to be educated, had the chance to be in powerful positions, and they're in those positions. It is for the community to hold them to account. Uh, and I, I, from that perspective, I don't reject the idea of social media, but where, where I really become concerned is when the political or ideological objectives of a very small group of individuals are, are played out in social media as a way, in a sense, of destroying or disrupting what is a very important process like we're trying to carry out now <clears throat> around the world is to control COVID. We're trying to stop a deadly virus that is killing hundreds of thousands uh, and soon to be two million people on this planet and possibly a lot more. We're trying to stop a deadly disease uh, and, we, and we need to do that and we need to be held to account for how we do that. But what we don't need are conspiracy theories and people disrupting and putting out bad information that is giving people a sense of the wrong thing to do or not believing that this virus is real or not believing that this is a real situation that we face as a global society. This is real uh, and downplaying it or creating conspiracy theories isn't helpful. But we live in this, we live in this world now and uh, I put it back to you Alex and, and the people who work in social media. How are we going to work with you out there who use this environment to make it the force for good that it is and to amplify that force for good that it is and that force for accountability that it is. It's in your hands. It's you that use the social media every day. You choose what this wonderful instrument will be used for, to advance our society or to push us back into a world in which we all hate uh, and which we all distrust. Is that the world we want? A world of distrust and hate and conspiracy? Uh, or do we want a world of respect? And accountability and a sense of responsibility uh, are they the values we want to, to 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 promote through the use of social media I'm sorry I'm I'm going on a bit here but uh, it's something very close to my heart because I'm a, I'm a real believer in in the idea of the individual and independence and rights and the right we have as individuals to express ourselves in our society is the fundamental basis of rights in health rights in law rights in race rights and so many other things and the social media is a massive tool to achieve so much in our society. Let's not let the haters destroy that platform for us. Thank you so much, Mike. It's a very powerful answer and motivational. Uh, we are running out of time, so um, I would like to thank all our viewers for watching us uh, from Malawi, Portugal, Turkey, Mexico, Cameroon, Pakistan, USA, France, Kenya, UK, Iran, Albania, Brazil, Nigeria, Thailand, Seychelles, and many more South Korea, Argentina, many, many more. Thank you for all your great questions. And uh, there have been a lot of questions regarding vaccines, COVID-19 vaccines. So I would like to let you know that tomorrow 
we'll do a Q&A live with our immunization expert who will be able to go more into detail on the news we got uh, and what we know so far about COVID-19 vaccines. So stay tuned with us, uh, visit our website, social media channels for the latest information. Until next week, please stay safe and uh, we'll share some examples and again, tips on how to stay Mike, Maria, do you have any closing words for today? No, thank, thank you so much. Happy New Year. Keep yourself safe. And you take care of yourself, Alex, and everyone out there in quarantine, take care of yourself. Everyone out there in isolation, take care of yourself. We're with you in spirit um, and, you, and, and you'll get through it. Thank you so much. Good.